Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Listen with Vobes. I am Richard Vobes, and here we go again. Um, it's four o'clock in the afternoon in Worthing. Might be a different time where you are, of course. Just check your watch. Um, and it's the 30th of December 2020 as we record this. And we've ditched the other books. <laughs> humour me, ladies and gentlemen. Please humour me. Uh, we've ditched the other books um, for the moment. I thought we'd just try something very different. Uh, an actu- A novel. A novel for a change. One that I imagine that none of you have read. Um, but you may have done. You may well have done. Uh, but before we get to that, let's just say a few hellos to a few people. Um, so hello to lovely Julia, who is there. We had a few troubles getting to find the stream. I don't know why. We put the stream on and Julia says, I can't find it. I can't find it. Then I look on my phone to see if I can find it. And it's not there. It's a pain. Turbo stream is there uh, from a re- chilly soon to be four shire tier four. Yes, and uh, Tall Podge, Rog, is uh, good afternoon. Justine Jones, hello, listening in the car, not driving. Been for a walk along Western Supermare Seafront. Oh, marvellous. Keep yourself warm in the car. Audrey Forbes, hello to you. Michael White, nice to see you. Lisa Fishbourne, good afternoon. I'm listening whilst I do mixed media art. Your voice is always lovely to hear. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa Fishbourne. Is that your name or is that where you're from, Fishbourne? Uh, That'd be interesting. Um, Justine Jones is... uh, Yeah, Billabong O'Neill, hello to you. The Green Man. Dave Over Yonder, hello. Uh, Cooper 68, nice to see you. Lee Lawson and John F. Philip Hammond and Mary and Andrew Norris Watt Ho. Lovely to see you all. Thank you very much for coming along. It's very kind. So we're going to try a different book. Uh, This is a novel. I have read this book a, a few years ago now and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, Sean says, anyone want to buy a copy of An Englishman Looks at Wales? Uh, yes, pl- oh no, I was going to say yes please, but I've got one. I've got it ready for firelighting. Uh, <laughs> so the book we're reading is this one, Children of the Archbishop by Norman Collins. He wrote a book called London Belongs to Me. I was in half a mind to read that. There is a video of that. Um, on The film was made in the 60s, I suppose with Richard Attenborough in it, uh, amongst other people. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Alistair Sim is also in that. But uh, this is another of his books, and they are they, they bring a wry smile, certainly when I've read them to myself. Um, so there we are. My surname is Fishbourne. I live in Ferring. Oh, right. Thank you, uh, Lisa. I didn't know, because sometimes people would just put their first name and, you know, sort of where they're where they're. From So I hope you didn't take offence at me asking. Uh, Lee Lawson says, glad you're still in one piece, Andrew. Oh, yes, because there was um, a earthquake in Croatia yesterday. Um, and I'm glad Andrew's all right. So that's all good. Just having a slurp of coffee here. So we're at over four o'clock. So shall we crack on and see what happens? So it's an odd book. It is an odd book, but um, I did enjoy it. So we'll see how we go. If we don't like it, we <laughs> we can always get shot of it. Uh, so as as ever, a book always has one of those legal things in the um, in the front. All the characters and institutions in this novel are purely fictitious where real places have been mentioned, they've been given names only because even fictitious characters have to live somewhere, take bus rides, go on railway journeys, eat in tea shops. Putney is Putney, all right, but you could search the whole of it, or the whole of London for that matter, without finding the original of the Archbishop Bodkin Hotel or any of its inmates, male or female, child or adult, weekly paid or salaried. I just thought I wanted to share that. It's the kind of book that it is. And that's the sort of person um, that Norman Collins was. Curiously, Norman Collins worked in television. Um, and he wrote quite a number of books. And he, he worked in television on, on at, at the BBC, I think. Or is it ITV? No, he helped set up ITV, I think it was. Um, an interesting chap. So, uh, yeah. Right. So the introduction is a curious one, but we have to read it because it's actually part of the story and you'll see why. 
So the first part is called Introduction in a London Bus. There are too many of them, too many, too various, and, in their separate and divergent ways, all too supremely important. But just take one bus load, for example, an ordinary number 14, Type S, plying somewhere between Hornsey and Roehampton. It isn't even full, this particular bus, but for all that it's crowded, packed solid, overflowing. I should say that this is published in, just to give you an idea of the period, I think it's 1940s, basically. I'll actually see in this one, but I think it's 1940s. It's pre-war, I believe. Start anywhere you like, right up in front, for instance, with the driver. His name is Sid Harris. He's been driving buses for nearly 10 years, ever since 1910, in fact. Even during the war, the, the Great War, that is, he was still hard at it. And when he came out, he was a full corporal in army transport. He still talks a lot about it these days. It was the crown of his life that fine September morning in 1914, sitting behind a slung tarp tarpaulin windscreen. They were the old B-type buses in those days, driving 48 of Sir John French's men, 32 inside and 12 standing, to meet General Heidenberg's army, just south of Arras. Naturally, it was the peak, you will say. It was history in the making, raw stuff of empires and all that. But that wasn't the way Sid saw it. It was the behaviour of the bus that impressed him, the way the engine boiled over, but the old thing still chugged along for another 30 miles or so before seizing up. He's mad about buses, is Sid. But not only about buses either. He's got hold of an extraordinary notion that someone is going to die and leave him a fortune. It's a good idea in its way, only somehow it hasn't got round to the other person. The dim benefactor apparently knows nothing of it. Not that this makes Sid doubt the truth of it. Only last night he was getting into bed, and he woke his wife up specially to mention it. Not long now, Viv, he told her, in the kind of voice that he always used when he was talking about his legacy. You wait and see. Yeah, just you wait. Maybe, maybe there in the morning... In short, poor old Sid's practically balmy about legacies by now. Balmy, but in a way happy too. Happy from sheer, unrealised expectation. Far happier than his conductor, Edward Musk. And that's funny when you come to think of it, because Edward Musk actually married money. When he took on Andrew McErnery's widow... She was worth every penny of £400, and Edward Musk got all of it, but he also got Mrs McErnery. In consequence, when he wasn't actually taking fares, he spends his time washing up, carrying trays, cooking little things in saucepans, opening the window, putting the cat out, letting it in again, turning the mattress, going round to the public library, buying little bunches of flowers, and generally trying to be as kind, loving, patient as and thoughtful as one should be with an invalid. For Mrs Musk is nowadays completely bedridden. It is something internal, something incurable. But what's more, she's gone all religious. And Edward Musk, with the 400 uh, still untouched in the bank and nothing to show for it except tracts and missionary magazines and holy pictures, is often so fed up that he wishes that he could have do something to speed up nature. Not that he ever will. He's far too quiet and timid and spiritless for that kind of thing, is Edward Musk. It's simply that he'd like to. And what makes it all so queer, when you come to think of it, if only he had known, he might have been able to pick up a hint or two just now from a t tuppenny fair. But how... He, but how was he to guess that the Tuppany to Warren Street and Brompton Road was a wife poisoner? That even now the dark stranger with all the deep cunning of a murderer is on his way to buy another bottle of Emmett's arsenic insect spray from a chemist in order to dispose of number two? The other passengers aren't all so sensational as that one. Poisoners are special. 
but in their own way the others are interesting too. There's that little faded, frightened-looking spinster in the second seat. She's a music mistress and she's been giving private lessons to practically tone-deaf daughters of a family grocer in Clerkenwell. Half a crown for the hour is what she got for it, and now she's going to. Sp and how is she going to spend the money? Sheet music, oratorios, a new case for a sec a new case for her second-hand two-guinea violin. Not a bit of it. She's saving up for a steamship ticket to Australia. Her wife's brother died over a year ago, and ever since then, the little music mistress has seen herself at has seen herself at his side, a big motherly creature in a vast new world, a heaven-sent, full-bosomed bo auntie, bringing up her four little nephews and three little nieces. She's only got seven pounds and ten shillings so far for the ticket, so she hasn't told her brother anything about it yet, but she's in earnest, all right. And because she's cut her personal expenses down to a bare minimum and is living on about two pence farthing a week, the nervous flicker of the eyelids, which was so bad when she was a child, has come back again. At times, she can't even see th to read the headlines, let alone her music. And she isn't sleeping too well because of the nervous strain and excitement. That's why she's so jumpy that she can't bear to have people touch her. She nearly screamed out loud just now when she felt Edward Musk thrusting, thrusting the change into her hand. There's nothing like that about the man opposite. He's in a state of positive, splendid equilibrium. He wears his ticket struck into his hat band and has thick, smooth lips like slices of orange peel. Through them, he whistles snatches of recent song hits. His suit is brown, with a broad white stripe in it, and his boots have clothed uppers. In his tie is a five-carat diamond or white sapphire, or zircon, or glass, or well, whatever it is, it's five carat and defiant. When he fingers it, which he does constantly, it looks somehow strange because his fingernails are so short and broken. But that comes from carrying his bag. He's a commercial traveller and he's been, and because he's been in fancy good, and because he's in the fancy goods line, pocket mirrors and manicure sets and that kind of thing, the contents are full of points and edges. He's 52. His name is Solly Green, and he's got 45 pounds in fivers strapped round his waist. There are two boa constrictor tattoos across his middle. His wife hasn't seen them for seven years, and she hopes that she will never see them again. He's living at the moment with a girl called Daisy, She's nearly 12 years his junior and calls him Daddy, only, of course, there aren't any children. Not by her, at least. And that's a pity, because perhaps a pair of little pattering feet would help keep them together. But only perhaps. There were three little patters all at once, remember, in his real home, and that didn't help. Quite the contrary, in fact. But it would be hard to find a formula for keeping Solly Green changed Cha cha chained permanently to any woman, and poor Daisy, the ghost designate already, is on her way out to join all the other ghosts in Solly's past. Poor Olive, poor Pearl, poor Elsie, poor Mabel, poor Doris, and poor the rest of them. In the meantime, Solly is still whistling, and he can afford to. He is now representing a powder puff with a small pink china doll in the centre for a handle. The doll is nude and its tiny hands cover up its embarrassed eyes most appealingly. It is the rage with the trade, that powder puff, though only with a certain class of customer. On the seat behind him is an elderly woman in black, obviously a grandmother. She is holding the hand of a solemn, preoccupied little girl. The solemn little girl sits bolt upright, her eyes fixed hard on space, her small mouth drawn into a thin, firm line. And there is something of the same fixity, the same preoccupation in the face of the grandmother. There they sit, the old woman and the little girl, holding hands and not speaking. They've been like this for the last five minutes, and it's obviously some important private silence that they're sharing. 
Then the little girl suddenly wrinkles up her nose, and as she does so, a tear runs down her cheek. Because the tear tickles, she puts out her tongue to intercept it. It is the top of the pink tongue that the elderly woman notices, and when she sees what is happening, she squeezes the child's hand harder. Is there tragedy here too? Has Papa got himself caught up in the machinery at the works, or has Mummy died? And does the little girl keep remembering her, or have they just been taking poor old Rover to be put down by the vet? No, as a matter of fact, it's none of these things. The old lady and her granddaughter have just been to a performance at the Finsbury Empire, where there was a performing seal, and the little girl loved it very much and knows that she won't see it again. And the seal that she keeps rem- it's the seal that she keeps remembering, not her mother. And once they're home again, Granny brief, and once they're home again, Granny's brief authority will be over, and she'll be useless, a useless, lonely old woman again. That's what's on Granny's mind. And that's what she's so quiet about. That accounts for everyone inside the bus, and there's no one outside because it's raining so hard. Ever since lunchtime, it's been coming down by the bucketful, and Sid Harris, on his little seat in front, is soaked right up to the elbows. He's one of these. He's got one of these mad theories, has Sid, that when it's wet, it's always wetter up Putney Way. And that certainly seems reasonable enough tonight, because they're over Putney Bridge already and mounting slowly towards the common. Meanwhile, the rain is coming down like a bath waste. In fact, Sid is just blindly cutting his way through water, darkness, and reflections, plunging through mirages. It's nearly nine o'clock already, but before he can call it a day, he's got to take the bus back all the way to Hat Hornsey to garage it. And then, just when he thinks he's got a clear stretch where he can get where he can let her rip, the bell above his head tings suddenly. He recognizes it for Edward Musk's delicate professional touch, and prepares to draw the bus up neatly and correctly alongside the next request stop. It's a young woman with a baby in her arms who is getting out. We haven't seen anything of her because she was sitting in the back. And from the way she was bending forward over the infant, her face was in shadow all the time. Not that there's anything in at least unusual about her. She's just any young woman of twenty-two or twenty-three in a raincoat and carrying a baby. She pauses for a moment and arranges the folds of the shawl carefully so as to protect the baby's face, and turns up her own coat collar before she reaches the platform. Then. Noticing the raindrops are falling on the baby's forehead, she opens the lapels of her coat almost as though she were going to feed the child, and clasps it closer against her bosom. The child whimpers faintly as she does so, and Sid Harris applies the handbrake. The young woman gets down carefully and is grateful when Edward Musk helps her off the step. But even though she is getting wetter every moment, she doesn't move off immediately. She stands there on the curb in a dazed, stupid kind of way, looking after the dull red lozenge that is the retreating rear lamp of number fourteen. Then, abruptly, as though remembering some forgotten purpose, she crosses the road, splashing through the puddles without even seeming to notice them, and with head averted from the driving rain, she begins to mount the steep slope of Saint Mark's Avenue. Well. That's that. The bus, with all its load of human treasure, has gone, and the young woman, whom we scarcely noticed at all, is all that's left of it. She's probably got, but she's probably better than nothing. So perhaps we'd better follow. There'll certainly be nobody else out on a night like this. It's a quiet, neglected sort of thoroughfare up which she is going. There is a high stone wall on one side, and the hedges and the front drives of substantial family mansions on the other. The avenue itself is composed of lime trees that climb up the hill, one above the other, and obscure the skyline. Not that there's any sky this evening. The avenue is simply a sheer black chasm, with gas lamps dotted faintly along it, 
more like clues to steer by than street lighting. Because the rain is rushing down the hill so fast, there are tracks of watery light leading up to each one of the lampposts. And it is outlined against one of these that we see the young woman still pressing on her way, her body bent forward as she climbs. Then, where the outline of the high stone wall is broken by the roof of a gatehouse, the woman stops suddenly and glances behind her. Even though it's too dark to see her face, the gesture is revealing. It's furtive, anxious, almost as though she's apprehensive about being followed. But there is no one else in sight in e either way, and apparently she is reassured, for without further hesitation she opens up her coat and, holding the baby in her long arm, sorry, holding her arms long enough to kiss it on the forehead, she places it gently and tenderly on the porchway of the gatehouse. She pauses for a moment to make sure the small bundle is secure there, that the rain can't reach it, that its shawl is keeping the chill of the stone away from it, that it can't roll over and smother itself. Then she reaches up for the heavy ornamental bell pull and jerks it violently. Somewhere inside the gatehouse a bell starts to jangle madly, and as though frightened by the din that she's made, the young woman starts to run. Up the hill she goes, her heels showing under her bedraggled skirt, up the hill and clean out of sight, clean out of sight and not a chance of catching up with her. She's lost, disappeared from view, vanished. At this moment, she's simply number 99 in London's Daily Hundred Mysteries. So you see, it didn't do us much good following her. We're left behind all alone in the wet and darkness of St Mark's Avenue, with nothing except a black doorway and an empty street. But not quite alone. There is a thin whimper of a child coming from the doorway, and a moment later there is the creak of a bolt being withdrawn and a shaft of pale daffodil-coloured light which shows up on the polished brass plate of the Archbishop Bodkin Orphan Hotel uh, Hospital and reveals the white woollen bundle on the doorstep. And that's the introduction. How are we doing? 21 minutes past. 1951. Oh, 1951. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Says Sean. Book one, The Bundle on the Doorstep, Chapter One. The gatehouse bell hung immediately above Sergeant Chiswick's chair in the porter's room. It was a small room and an uncommonly large bell, even when the wrought iron handle outside was pulled ever so gently, the bell inside blazed like a toxin or tocin, T-O-C-S-I-N, I'm not sure what that is. It had a high hysterical note, that bell, Tonight, however, it was as if some new kind of musical bomb had exploded just over Sergeant Chiswick's head. At one moment there he was, sitting quietly, stirring a thick spoonful of condensed milk into his cocoa, and at the next the bell had peeled forth and he had spilt half the contents of the cup, all the rich throffy part, onto his knees as he got up. Then, mopping his trousers to prevent himself from being scolded, he glanced apprehensively above him and saw that the bell was swinging through its full arc of 180 degrees. He had seen it swing like that before, and he knew it meant trouble. Sliding his feet hurriedly into his carpet slippers, he started sloping off down the stone passageway. He saw the bundle immediately, but he knew better than to waste his time on it, Sergeant Chiswick was not a man to be fooled by runaways. Reckless of the weather, he went right into the middle of St Mark's Avenue and shouted, Hi there! Hi there! And as loudly as he could utter, and having shouted it once, he shouted it again. But it was of no use. After the brightness of the porter's room, the night outside was as black as a cellar, and though he thought he saw a figure of a woman, 
a figure which in the course of time became transformed in Sergeant Chiswick's memory into that of someone wearing a large picture hat and an expression of almost unearthly tragedy, he was never really sure. All that he knew for certain was that his shirt and waistcoat were already soaked through and that in the porchway behind him there was a baby crying. It tickled up... It, it tickled up Sergeant Chiswick's lumbago bending over to lift the baby, but by, going right, but by going right down on one knee, he was able to gather it up all right, and pulling the door shut behind him with his foot, he shuffled back along the stone passage to the lodge. Because his arms were entirely filled by the bundle, he opened his own door with his shoulder and sidled carefully into the living room. The bell on the wall was still swinging, but the baby was crying so shrilly that Sergeant Chiswick hardly noticed the bell. Besides, he was busy undoing the shawl that was damp from the rain that had driven on it. When he had unrolled the outer layer of the cocoon, he straightened himself and placed the baby in his own armchair. Then he stood back and inspected it. He was a good judge of babies and he reckoned this particular one to be somewhere around a fortnight or about three weeks, under a month certainly, and as well nourished as a baby of that age should be. It had more hair than most babies, dark, shining hair. Sergeant Chiswick began to stroke it with his forefinger. No more sentimental than most regimental sergeant majors, Sergeant Chiswick nevertheless suddenly felt strangely compassionate towards this particular baby, and more than compassionate, he felt positively paternal. A moment later, he fell he felt flattered as well, for either because of this gentle, regular stroking of its skull or because of the heat of the tiny room, Sergeant Chiswick lived for preference in an atmosphere that would have parched and withered up a cactus, or because of the pleasant tinkling that was now all that was remained of the original bell peal, the baby abruptly stopped crying. Then, opening its dark, unfocusing eyes very wide, it stared up at its rescuer. Poor little chap, Sergeant Chiswick said feelingly. You poor little unwanted old thing. While he was addressing it, Sergeant Chiswick had temporarily forgotten his stroking. In consequence, the baby immediately started to crease up its face again. Wide white circles appeared around its eyes, its mouth began to descend and its chest swelled up under the folds of the inner woollen shawl. But Sergeant Chiswick was too quick for it. Before the first yell could reach the surface, he had run his finger rapidly round the lid of the condensed milk tin and thrust a sweet stickly fingernail between the baby's lips. Then, hastily rewrapping the shawl and tucking the fringe in carefully, he shored up the bundle with a couple of cushions on either side of it and went off in search of Mrs Gurnett. Mrs Gurnett's room was on the far side of the courtyard past the boys' lavatories and the statue of Archbishop Bodkin. It was the Cranmer block where Mrs Gurnett was quartered and to get there Sergeant Chiswick had to make a hundred yard dash from this, the Latimer side. The Putney rain was still coming down, just the way Sid Harris said it always did. The expanse of, sh the expanse of shelterless asphalt in front of him became a pool, a lake, a reservoir. But Sergeant Chiswick could not afford to stop now. Taking off his jacket and putting it over his head like a poke bonnet, he made a dash for it. And there was no relief even when he reached the high Gothic doorway on the other side. The green front door marked Matron was already shut fast for the night and there was nothing for it but for him to stand there in the wet tugging at the bell pull. A moment later a window on the second floor was raised violently and a woman's head appeared. It was too dark to see very plainly and in any case the rain was getting in his eyes. All that he could make out was a blur against the white window curtain. But the voice was Mrs Gurnett's all right. Well? it asked. 
Sergeant Chiswick tilted his head back and screwed up his features as the rain beat down on his face. There's been an arrival, he said. What's that you say? A baby. Someone's just left one. Where? On the doorstep. There was a pause. Stay where you are. I'm coming down. Are you enjoying it so far? Is it any good? Are we doing all right? Right, carry on then. I'll have another slurp of tea. Linda Kane had a quick look at reviews of this book. Sounds promising. Excellent. It is a good book. I've read it before, so rest assured you're in good company with old Norman Collins. Not all of Norman Collins is a great, but uh, this one's all right. It was her mouth that Mrs Gurnett... Sorry, it was her mouth that Mrs Gurnett's most remark... It was her mouth... Oh, sorry, yes. It was her mouth that was Mrs Gurnett's most remarkable feature. Thin and bloodless, it curved downward like a new moon inverted. There was disgust in this mouth. Bitter, unconcealed disgust. Disgust at the very pattern of life as human beings lived it. The unbridled desires of men, the wantonness of women and young girls, the whole displeasing unnecessariness of sex. And because of a nuptial flight of her own that long ago had been so full of spring, so brief, so disastrous. It was 32 years ago when it had happened, but she remembered every minute, every incident, every single detail of the shame as clearly as though, even now, the wax tip of Mr Gurnett's ginger moustache was tickling her cheekbone through the open meshwork of her veil. And she remembered other things as well, the tainted metal of the ring, the breathless the breathless tobacco-laden kisses, the hotel at Ramsgate with its private bathroom, that horrible slot machine on the pier on which Mr Gurnett spent no less than sevenpence on the second day of the honeymoon and going back again, again and again with his bride and going back to it again and again until his bride had felt like jumping fully clothed into the sea from sheer humiliation. And then the awful third day the arrest, the charge of bigamy, the hysterics and, and the last glimpse of Mr Gurnett with his wonderful white teeth gleaming and tears in his deep bedroom eyes as he was whisked away to the police station in a growler. Lesser women would have been broken by such an experience, but not this one. She had rallied, struck out, tried to save her own honour pawning the only present that Mr Gurnett had ever given her, a dressing set, in imitation tortoiseshell, she had bought herself a complete set of widow weeds and had returned to London, tragic, shattered and with the mythical funeral in the background. It was only the name that haunted her, much as she would have preferred to become plain Mrs Lippet, Miss Lippet again, widowhood, even false widowhood, was indispensable to her good name. Swathed in her own deceit, Mrs Gurnett, she remained, and she prospered, worked her way up towards matron of an orphanage. She was still, she was independent again, still heartily and unfluctuatingly opposed to sin, but she had lived for twenty years largely supported by the fruits of it. She reached the bottom of the stairs by now and was drawing back the bolts that secured the door. A swirl of rain eddied in on her and the gas jet in the glass cage jerked and bounded, but Mrs Gurnett promptly thrust her head out into the fury of the storm. Did you get her? she demanded. Uh, too quick, Sergeant Chiswick answered. She got away. Ah. <sighs> Mrs Gurnett had spoken, and in speaking she had uttered the very sound that such a mouth was made for. This was no time for recriminations. There was a baby that needed looking after. I'll call Nurse Stedge, she told him. Nurse Stedge's room was at the far end of the bottom corridor. There was a light she was a light sleeper, and Mrs and as Mrs Gurnett approached, the door opened obediently. 
A tall, giraffe-necked woman, Nurse Stedge, stood there in the gas-lit passage. Her black emergency bag, the one with the curved pins and the nappies and the pair of blunt nose scissors in it, clasped ready in her long blue hand. Come along, Mrs Gurnett told her. We're wanted. They had got as far as the entrance to the courtyard and were just turning into the covered part, the cloisters, where a bracket gas lamp was gleaming, when they were nearly bumped into by somebody else. It was Canon Edward Mallow, the warden. He had not seen them coming because he was walking with head down, violently opening and shutting his umbrella in an endeavour to shake off the drips. At the sound of footsteps, however, he looked up in surprise. Ah, uh, Mrs Gurnett, he said, going out, I see. As he looked up, the light from the gas bracket fell full on him and showed a round, pink face with very open, pale blue eyes. It was the, fail, the face of an elderly and puzzled cherub. And as he looked, his expression of puzzlement increased. Nothing wrong, is there? he asked. There was something in the quiet and gentle undertone of the canon's voice that came as bitter corrosive poison to a woman of Mrs Gurnett's temperament. Sergeant Chiswick's got a new baby in his room, she told him. That's what's wrong. A baby? Canon Mallow repeated as though the whole idea of a baby in the Archbishop Bodkin Hospital came as a surprise to him. Oh, ah, yes. I, I, I thought I heard one crying as I came in. Where, where did it come from, might I ask? Off the doorstep, sir, Sergeant Chiswick replied. I just found it. Canon Mallow, however, made no movement. But don't you see, he said, it's providential. It means we have kept our numbers up. We are back on the 500 mark again. They made quite a crowd, the four of them, in the small stuffy room of the flowered wallpaper and narrow gothic windows. Sorry, with the... F I'll read that again. They made quite a crowd, the four of them, in the small stuffy room with the flowered wallpaper and narrow gothic windows. windows. Like everything else in the Archbishop Bodkin Hospital, the room was bleak, ecclesiastical, uncompromising. Even the wallpaper, upside-down bunches of peonies tied round with knots of lavender ribbon, had faded with the years into no more than a faint autumnal background. And the coronation group of Edward and, Ele Edward and Alexandra, painted in brightly varnished colours on the lid of a biscuit tin, marked, marked family assorted, assumed in its setting the formal devotional air of a rich and rather splendid icon. But already Nurse Stedge was getting down to her work. With the uncontradictable authority of her calling, she pushed in front of everyone, even in front of Mrs Gurnett, and began to undo the baby's shawls. Twisting and turning the bundle on her lap like a bobbin, she soon had it stripped down to the flannelette vest and nappies, and as soon as the small dappled shoulders were bare, she inspected each bicep critically. Ah! she said. Not vaccinated. Or christened, probably, Canon Mallow added. Or registered, Mrs Gurnett said, snapping her mouth too again when she had spoken. Or wanted, added Sergeant Chiswick in an undertone. But meanwhile, Nurse Stedge was steadily burrowing deeper. Then, as she loosened the vest, she said, ah, again. As she had come... At she had come on to something. There was a length of ribbon fastened round the baby's neck and on the end of the ribbon was hung a piece of card. Mrs Gurnett realised at once that this was important. If there was a name on it, it might even clinch matters. It might be evidence. Therefore, feeling that she had been kept out of the mystery quite long enough already, she abruptly thrust Nurse Stedge to one side and removed the card herself. Holding it up to the light, she examined it, and she was right. There was a name on it. Across the card, in large, irregular letters, appeared the one word, Sweetie.
But that is all there was. The letters had been deliberately printed in capital to defeat the calligraphists. The cardboard was the kind that is found in the cheapest of cardboard boxes and cheap cardboard boxes are thrown away every day in their tens of thousands. Canon Mallow, however, was not content until he had examined the card himself. He took it from Mrs Gurnett's fingers, then slowly, with maddening and unspeedable slowness, he changed into his other pair of spectacles, his reading ones, and scrutinised the card as though he expected invisible writing to spring to life as he looked at it. Finally, he turned it over and inspected the back as well. But Sweetie was all it said. Extraordinary! Canon Mallow remarked, really most extraordinary. But Mrs Gurnett and Nurse Stedge were used to ignoring Canon Mallow at such moments. They were already engaged in the ultimate and profounder intimacies, and they were clicking their tongues disapprovingly over what they had found. Sergeant Chiswick, therefore, addressed himself to Callan, Canon Mallow with the air of a man turning to man with the air of man turning to man in too exclusive feminine society. While they're um, getting on with him, sir, he pointed out, one of us had better ring up the station. Uh, should it be you or me, sir? Canon Mallow frowned slightly. The station? he inquired. What, now? A uh, police station, sir, Sergeant Chiswick explained. Canon Mallow's frown cleared away. Oh, yes, yes, to be sure, the police station. <laughs> yes, we, we mustn't forget the police station. Having disposed of that point, Canon Mallow shook his head thoughtfully. Oh, the sadness of it all, he said slowly. The tragedy. Sergeant Chiswick stroked at his moustache in a manner which indicated that he too was of the sensitive sort who recognised sadness and tragedy when he met it. Hardly a month old, he continued in the same vein, and a fine little lad too. Girl, said Mrs Gurnett suddenly, turning her small fierce eyes contemptuously in Sergeant Chiswick's direction. And under a week, Nurse Stedge added to complete the picture of Sergeant Chiswick's, Sergeant Chiswick's ignorance. But Callan Mallow, Canon Mallow, merely smiled. I thought it was a very odd name for a boy, he said. If it's a girl, that explains it. And as he said it, he bent over the child. Poor little sweetie, he said. Now let me give you a kiss. Mrs Gurnett and Nurse Stedge both stepped forward to prevent him. You don't know what the baby's got the matter with. You don't know what that baby's got the matter with her. What? You don't... You don't know what that baby's got the matter with her, Mrs Gurnett said sharply. And the child requires attention, added Nurse Stedge de decisively. Canon Mallow, however, suddenly found that he had no patience for either of them. Picking the baby up, he kissed her on the centre of the forehead. Now you're one of us, sweetie, he said. And I hope you're going to be happy here. And that is the end of chapter one. Richard somehow chooses just the perfect accents for each character. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, are you a, a reading? Yes, Richard's doing a good job. Oh, good. Extremely pleasant to listen to. Oh, that makes uh, me happy. We still have a few more minutes, though. We'll start chapter two, see where we get. Oh, chapter two is very short. Chapter two. But don't begin getting the wrong ideas about the place. Don't imagine that there were mysterious women tugging away at the bell pull of the Archbishop Bodkin Hospital every single night. Dismiss entirely the mental picture of unwanted babies landing up on the doorstep as a kind of regular daily delivery. That wasn't a bit the way of things that were in St Mark's Avenue. If anything, life there was rather on the quiet side, just the fiddling day-by-day -day affairs of big institutions. One of the girl's mistresses, a Miss Dewchurch, resigned to look after her infant invalid father, and a Miss Speedworthy, whose, who 
whose own father, incidentally, was caused, causing quite a bit of anxiety within the family circle, came in to take Mrs Dewchurch's place. No one could say for how permanently. And old boy, one Charlie Spencer, got himself sentenced to three years hard labour on a charge of burglary, two other charges of housebreaking and one of receiving, being taken into account and the sentences allowed to run co concurrently. A present bodkin in Ginger Woods, aged three, in a sudden fit of temper, threw ink, an inkwell at another inmate, and a red haired and a rather short sighted little girl, Lettuce Moon, died from complications following a sharp attack of measles. But that's nothing, really. Nothing among five hundred. As for Sweetie, she had settled herself in very nicely, or rather, they were always on the point of thinking that she had, but she was a high-strung sort of child, a perfect little angel on Monday, but she would be all tantrums, stampings, pinchings and rages by Tuesday, and she was awkward and acquisitive, not over sweets, which she didn't seem to care about, but over things like toys. There was one particular pink rabbit that she seemed to regard as her own, despite the fact that there was an absolutely clear rule that was explained to all the children in the hospital that every toy was to be shared in the common. They had removed the rabbit from her so that she couldn't remember how often. But somehow she always contrived to get it back again and was usually discovered somewhere by herself talking to it, kissing it, pushing it, putting it to sleep. Obviously there was affection and to spare inside the child, and it was largely a matter of, and it was largely a matter, as Canon Mallow told them, of developing it, making it grow outwards, teaching her that there were more important things than pink rabbits in the world. As it was, there was only one person of whom she seemed fond, really fond, that is, and even there, it showed what a queer, contra contrary nature the child had because it wasn't Nurse Stedge or Mrs Gurnett or anyone who did things for her all the time. It was one of the hospital visitors who came only on Thursday when the nurses had their time off. What's more, it didn't even seem a particularly good choice, for instead of choosing Mrs Lampret, who was the doctor's widow, or Miss Giles, who had a brother who was a magistrate, or even Mrs Chapman, who spent her whole life visiting infirmaries and children's homes and prisons and things, she chose Margaret, who was a nobody. No family, no background, no position, merely one of the maids in the household of Dame Eleanor Pryke chairman of the Archbishop Bodkin Board of Governors. It indeed had become rather a surprise to some people that Margaret, at her age, should want to spend so much of her spare time in looking after other people's children. But it was all put down to the splendid seriousness of purpose with which Dame Eleanor infused anyone with whom she came in contact. Even to enter into Dame Eleanor's service was to become a kind of social missionary, and there was no finer training for marriage, Dame Eleanor had repeatedly and emphatically declared, than practical babycraft. That was presumably why Margaret was there, because it was obvious that she was one of the marrying kind all right. Placid, sensible, well set up and undeniably good-looking, it was assumed that she would that she was just getting her hand in, preparing herself for life and babies of her own. Dame Eleanor was pleased to see such things turning out that way. She thought highly of Margaret, sufficiently highly to have taken her back into service after the girl had gone away to look at a sick father or a sick mother or a sick someone. Dame Eleanor couldn't remember the details, except that they were sad, and who had eventually been considerate enough to die and so release her again. And Sweetie had taken to Margaret from the very start. Indeed, when Sweetie was in one of her difficult moods, Margaret was the only one who could do anything with her. If she had been forced to choose between Margaret and the pink plush rabbit, it's even possible that she would have chosen Margaret. 
And that's really all about there is. And that's really about all... Hang on. And that's really about all that there is up to date to say about Sweetie. Certainly nothing very sensational so far. But for that matter, there was nothing very sensational at the time about the whole Archbishop Bodkin Hospital. No, during Sweetie's first three years at the place, everything went on quietly and placidly as if it had done during the as, as it had done during the preceding three centuries. Then, something really did happen. Canon Mallow retired. The canon himself had seen it coming for some time, ever since he had joined the hospital 17 years ago. 60 was retiring age, and it was at the age of 60 that he had now reached. And there, and that was all there was to it. But for those who remained, for the under 60s, there was unrest, speculation, anxiety, turmoil in the outcome. For even even for Canon Mallow himself, there was undefined uneasiness that could not quite dis- he could not quite dispel, and the more he thought about, sorry, and the more he thought about tomorrow's interview with his successor, the last interview that he would ever hold in his study, the less somehow he was looking forward to it. After all, seventeen years is a long time. And there I think we will leave it, because chapter 3 starts with who is the successor to calm little Captain... Captain... Cannon Mallow. And what will be the shake-up and the change and the things? Dum-de-dum-de-dum. What's Linda Kane dum-de-dumming again for? Dum-de-dum-de-dum. What do you mean by that? It does have a ring to it. What? What? I'll call you, sweetie, if you call me Dudley. I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, there we are. Um, I hope you enjoyed that bit. We'll give it another whirl tomorrow and see if we uh, enjoy it some more. Maybe it will work. Maybe it won't. Who knows? Um, You seem very quiet out there in the world of typing. Have you all fallen asleep? Dum-de-dum-de-dum. I don't know what Linda was on about. I think Richard is going to eat his eat this book. He certainly has got his into his stride. Oh, doom music. Dum de dum dum dum. Oh, I see. Dum de dum dum dum. Oh, I've got you. <laughs> Sorry, I read it as dum de dum dum dum. <laughs> what is the book club on the back cover? Says Turbo Stream. The back cover is this is book club edition. Members buy books published at eight shillings and sixpence, ten shillings and sixpence, and twelve shillings and sixpence for three shilling, shillings and sixpence. These are Foil Foils Book Club, 121 Charing Cross Road, London, WC2. I don't think you can get it now. I'm not sure that they still have it. Loving the story, Richard. We're hanging on your every word. It's flowing quite easily. Yes, I just I am stumbling over a few words, all these different characters and things, just trying to remember who they were and what what significance. Very enjoyable. Looking forward to the next instalment. Thank you very much. Well, it's I, I did enjoy it when I read it, and I was there were elements in it that makes me laugh out loud. Um, very intriguing. I can only think of Tom Jones at this point, says Josh Josh Hastings. Yes, well. It's not unusual to be in love with anyone. Anyway, enough of Tom Jones. Um, we were going to call Dudley Sweetie Sawyer from now on. Ah, great choice, Richard. Looking forward to tomorrow's reading. Thanks, Richard. Great choice. Oh, Foils, the bookshop. Ah, I see. Yes, foiled again. Right. I will uh, go and uh, light my essay, get my dinner ready, and then I'll be back for the Vogue show later on. Thank you very much. Look after yourselves. Julia says, I really wish I could give ten thumbs up. Ah, bless your little socks. Agreed. Good choice. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, the only thing about uh, reading a novel, of course, is there's uh, very little looking things up and digressing. That's the only thing. Um, But uh, we'll see how we go with this. It's a bit of a change, isn't it? A bit of a change, a change of pace. And uh, bye, everybody. Everyone called Sweetie. 
Yes, I mean, I've read it before and I know I know sort of things that you don't know yet. So it's quite interesting. Anyway, I've got to try and remember it all. Um, and I will catch up with you anon. Take care. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Bye.